And hey, um, as many of you know, today's a special day. It's game seven, okay? Uh, the Suns. And so if you just want to partner in prayer with me at five o'clock today, uh, from about five to about eight, okay, just ancestry prayer. Okay, we're going to sit there. We are going to be fasting and praying. And if you're a, a, like a Mavs fan, there's a church across the street. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 I kid and in jest, but uh, be careful. So, uh, <laughs> Hey, does anyone know what a palindrome is? Uh, th- uh, this word here, right? So, so this word, a palindrome, and now some of you know it. Uh, some of you may have just been introduced to it a couple years ago with the incredible movie called Tenet, directed and written by Christopher Nolan, who is one of the greatest direct. Somebody clapping back there. He knows what I'm talking about. Hey, let's go, okay? Uh, as defined by uh, the Webster's Dictionary, a palindrome is a word, phrase, or sequence that reads the same backwards and forward. To give you some context, here's a couple examples. Uh, 91019 is read the same frontwards as backwards. Tenant. Nurses run is a phrase. If you read it one way and backwards, it's the same thing. Hannah, kayak, race car, wow. Mom and deleveled. Yes, mom, thank you. That's my mom, by the way. Uh, and and the level. These are all palindromes where you could read them the same frontwards and the same backwards. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, the big reason is, is because, as Carlisle said, we are in the book of Acts and in a series called Ecclesia, uh, which is actually uh, the original word in the Greek that was translated semi-roughly into English that we have the word church. But the reason why it's semi-rough is because when we think of church, especially uh, when this was translated, uh, we think of buildings or sculptures or we think of uh, stained glass windows, crucifixes. We think of the Pope sometimes. Like it just depends on what you think about it. And so we think about these four walls. Well, Ecclesia in and of itself was a gathering of Jesus' followers who went out and changed the world. And so as Carlisle uh, alluded to that we wanted to do this as we go into summer because we don't want to be just a church that gathers together in a building. We want to be a church that gathers together outside because we are the church. And so as we look in Acts, we see these people that had no electricity, Uh, No running water, right? Uh, No uh, social media. They didn't have a church funding plan. They didn't have any type of systems or processes to get influxes of people into our church. Uh, But they just simply went out with the message of Jesus and they changed the world. And so how could we look at this original historical document of Acts and say, okay, God, you did it once in Jerusalem. I'm praying you do it again here at Journey. And how could we, as people who call ourselves Jesus followers here in this local expression of the church, how could we then go out and make an impact like they made all across the Mediterranean Sea in the world that we have today? So back to palindromes. You see, As we look through the book of Acts, the past several weeks, we've looked at these certain calling cards. And these calling cards have been rather specific, but rather over the next two weeks, this is really part one and part two, uh, I want to cover what I think are the two palindromes or, or the two themes as you read Acts, frontwards or backwards, backwards or front, you will see this theme that is constantly across every single chapter, every single verse, every single line, and every single word in which we have. And the first one is evangelism. Uh, evangelism has a lot of different connotations as you think of it. You think of those guys on the signs and the pickets, you know, go to hell, and here's 15 verses that's going to make your life awful. Uh, And there's other times when you actually see it when it comes to church. Well, uh, evangelism uh, is a bracket, as I call it, in Acts. It opens up in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 8, when it says this. This is Jesus talking. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Right off the bat, Jesus actually gives his second uh, call and mandate for people to go and spread the gospel. In Matthew 28, he also says, uh, therefore go and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And right before he's about to ascend into heaven in Acts, he gives this one as well. Go out and be my witness. In the book of Acts is this entire story of how the, uh, these people were his witness. And in fact, the very last verse of Acts, in Acts 28, 31, this is what uh, Luke talks about when it comes to the Apostle Paul. He says, Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God 
uh, and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The book of Acts opens up with evangelism, and the book of Acts continues today with evangelism. And so we see frontwards or backwards, backwards or forth, evangelism is an absolute key and a theme throughout the entire thing. And here's the amazing part when it comes to this is that when we look at the story of Acts, it was normal people, normal Jesus followers who weren't just the apostles, though Luke covers uh, parts of Peter's story and most of Paul's story uh, throughout the book of Acts, but it really is just a bunch of people who believed in Jesus, who took up the personal responsibility to go out and tell other people. In fact, the contributing factor to the growth of the church is that individuals decided that they were going to take the mandate of Jesus seriously and move forward. It's interesting. There was a time between 65 AD when the Apostle Paul died and 313 AD when the Christian religion became the official religion of the Roman Empire. So we have several hundred years there where Christians were uh, being crucified, killed in the Colosseum, being eaten by tigers, being flogged, lit on fire, uh, killed for their faith, and yet it grew like wildfire. But during this entire time, until it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, there is not, as far as we can tell, one single greatest missionary name that we know of. There are great church leaders that we know of. But there's not one person that we could say, hey, this person went out and told all these different cultures, all these different times. That wasn't it. Rather, it was the people in their communities who went out and told the story of Jesus. And so I've separated this message into two parts just for us to kind of wrap our heads around, especially as we think about evangelism. Uh, And the first one is evangelism as seen in Acts. Exactly what was it? How did they do it? And then the second part relates to you and me. It's evangelism as seen at Journey. So as we look at evangelism as seen in Acts, we're going to look over three main things, and all three of them start with M's, okay, so you don't forget it. It's like a Baptist minister, three points, three things, all start with the same letter, okay? The first thing is is that we're going to look is called the mandate. The next is the message, and the third is the methods. This is what we see evangelism throughout the entire book of Acts fits in one of these three categories, the mandate, the message, and the method. So we're going to look at number one, which is the mandate. We've already covered this. Acts chapter one, starting in verse eight, Matthew 28. We are looking at this idea that Jesus gave a mandate to the first Jesus followers as their mission from their Lord Jesus, and they simply took it and ran with it. There was no questioning. This was from God, and if it's from God, it's going to be through me. I am going to be the one that goes and tells people. But in the American progressive Christianity in which we find today, a lot of us believe that the mandate by Jesus isn't a mandate. Rather, it's a suggestion. Anyone have kids? I think what you tell them might just be a suggestion sometimes. So for a lot of us, uh, when we look at this mandate that Jesus says to go and be my witness, go and make disciples, uh, a lot of us just think, well, okay, well, if I'm good enough, uh, if I understand the message enough, if I feel like it, if I don't want conflict, if an opportunity only arises, uh, I'm just going to try to live right, act right, and I'm going to hope that people will actually hear the message of Jesus. Uh, If I go, well, then if there's conflict, I'm not a conflict person, so Jesus, like, make sure it's an easy easiest, most comprehend, or most easiest road, uh, the most uh, uh, careful road uh, that there is out there for me to actually tell somebody about Jesus. So Jesus, I will actually do it, but you got to make it easy on me. Jesus, I will actually go out, but, but only if I feel like it. Only if, man, only if there's just that one person that I'm trying to work on the entire, no, no, that wasn't it. It's a mandate which means that it is an order. Jesus is telling you, not just Cam, not just Carlisle or anyone or Jen or anyone else on the church staff or in church staffs to go and grow the church. Rather, he says, you go be my witnesses across the world. And if Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said that he did and he rose again from the grave, defeating death and sin, forgiving you of your sin... How are we not telling people about it? 
It was uh, one of the great duos, uh, one of them, of Penn and Teller, the great uh, uh, comedic uh, atheists, who he goes, look, I don't even believe in Jesus. I'm not going to believe in Jesus at all. But for those of you who call yourselves Jesus followers, if you believe that Jesus really is the only way, how much do you have to hate me to not tell me about him? Your silence of not telling people who you know tells them more than they need to know sometimes. It's like, well, obviously you don't believe it to be uh, incredibly true unless you would be telling me about it. You see, uh, I've been thinking about this. We're going to hit this uh, quite a lot over the next couple weeks, just this idea of this American Christianity that we have today, which simply says this. Uh, A lot of people, and in fact, Barna came out with a a group that Generation Z believes that it is 60% immoral to share your faith with somebody else. 60%, and it's actually 40% millennials, that a lot of people are beginning to think that, hey, one of what, I believe in Jesus and I'm good, uh, but hey, uh, if you believe in something else, you do you. It is not my right, nor my responsibility, nor, nor my mandate to share my faith with you. So if you're a Mormon, keep on living your way. If you're a Hindu, keep living that. If you're uh, Islam uh, and a Muslim, keep that way. New Age theists or a Wiccan or an atheist, progressive Christianity, whatever it is, hey, you just believe whatever you want to believe, and I'm going to be good with what I believe. And if that is your thought process, and if that is your worldview, I'm going to lovingly tell you you're wrong. Jesus didn't say, hey, go tell other people unless they believe in someone else. Hey, go tell other people about me uh, unless they're good in their faith. Uh, Go tell other people unless they fill in the blank. You know it. Jesus gave a mandate to go and tell the message. So what is the message? Well, the message we see, it it says it in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 12. It says, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Here's the deal. If there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved, if salvation is found in no one else, that means that Jesus is the only way, not a way. That it is an exclusive claim that Jesus is the only way. And in fact, we see that Paul, all throughout his missionary work in Acts, um, is, is, put, is preaching this word, uh, and it is offensive to culture because it goes against the Jewish traditions of the day. And he's actually put into prison for preaching this. So you know what Paul does in prison? Well, he preaches it even more, okay? And so we see in Acts chapter 16 that Paul is in prison. There's a prison guard there, and Paul's like, well, I got an audience of one, so may as well tell him about Jesus. And so he tells him about Jesus. The prison guard believes, goes home to his family. They believe, and now this man was changed by Jesus, who has once chained Paul to a wall. He is now washing his wounds because of the message of Jesus. You see, it's a simple message. It is a hard message that Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for your sins and for mine, and rose again, defeating death. And whoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? Have eternal life. But eternal life here and now and then and there. This is the idea is that now we bring heaven to earth with this message. Uh, And so in this world, once again, we find this superficial spirituality where people are, hey, man, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. It it never makes sense to me, okay? Uh, It's like, I don't know what that means. So people try to mix and match spirituality. Uh, They try to mix and match a little bit of Jesus, maybe a a, a little bit of... of, um, you know, new ageism, a a little bit of Wiccan, a a little bit of all these things. And they try to mix in that spirituality when they have to understand that there's only one way to God. There's not any other way. And so we try to mix and match. And so uh, maybe you've done this. I know I did this as a kid. Uh, Whenever you went to a restaurant with your family and your parents were paying for the food uh, and the drinks, um, you would get a cup and you go up to the soda fountain. Anyone else do this? And you, like all the way down the line, begin to fill it up till it's the very top, until it's like this weird greenish color, right? Does anyone know what we call that? Well, okay, we'll take it easy, okay? <laughs> we called it, said that a little too, uh, anyways. Uh, we called it a graveyard. 
Because that's exactly what you get when you mix and match. That's exactly what you get when you mix and match spirituality. You get nothing but a spiritual graveyard that produces no life and no fruit. You see, uh, their only way is to have a relationship with Jesus. It is God's offense of this world for you to go out. This is how we carry the ball in football terms down the field. And this is offensive to culture because why? Well, it says you're wrong. You're sinful. You're broken. You need saving. You need help. And I know who can give it to you. It's offensive to the world, but it's God's offense to change the world. This message of Jesus is the only way that someone can be saved. But there are ways in which we do it. It's not Carlisle getting up there with the sign, smacking people with it, or smacking upside head with the Bible. Sometimes that works. Maybe that's your story. You're walking down the street, and you were costasized by some man throwing a Bible at you. I have no idea. Uh, maybe that was your story. But in Acts, we see four different methods. Uh, the first one is preaching. Preaching. Now, that's probably to no shock. But one-third of the book of Acts is actually speeches or preaching to uh, large groups and large audiences. We see Peter at Pentecost in Acts 2. Stephen, before he was murdered for this message in Acts 7. Paul addresses the Jews in Antioch in Acts 13. He preaches in Athens in Acts 17. To the Roman governor Felix in Acts 24. And King Agrippa in Acts 26. All throughout the message of Acts and all throughout really history, we see people preaching this message, getting up on stage with a captivated audience, large group, and telling this message of Jesus. And maybe that's the way that you came to faith. We've got the John Wesleys, the Charles Spurgeons, to Billy Graham, right? Like we have all these people to your local church here uh, in whatever church you may have grown up in. People preach this message in hopes that there would be salvation. But once again, to the normal American Christian, preaching or inviting people to church is the only form of evangelism that we think. And I want to make this clear. Inviting people to church is great. It's not evangelism. That's just an invite. So hopefully that the pastor doesn't talk about sex or money, right? Because all of a sudden, like, well, sorry about that. Here's a hot dog. Okay, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But preaching was only one-third. There were other ways. And in fact, we just see these great apostles and teachers do it. But there was a larger impact in number two, which was the individual witness. Preaching is public, where individual witness is personal. Uh, of course, we see the apostles go out. Thomas goes to India and some other areas. But, but we see Priscilla and Aquila who helped support the church in Ephesus. They're just briefly mentioned. We see that there are large groups and pockets of Jesus' followers in Rome and in Italy and in Egypt. And the amazing thing is, we don't even know who went out to these areas in the first place. We just know that people took it upon themselves to go either, either when they came to Jerusalem, they went back home. And when they went back home, they shared this message to those who were around them after Pentecost. You see, they, they, the, uh, these people just preached the gospel and taught Jesus where they were at. They didn't need a special moment. They didn't need, hey, why don't you just come to Starbucks and sit down for a little bit? Uh, they didn't need any of that. It was just simply as they were walking, as they were going, as they were eating, as they were shopping or working, they just told this message of Jesus. And I, I just find it hard to believe that in a world where everybody can be so proud of their personal beliefs, that, uh, that your employers, employees are able to speak about whatever they want, be proud about whatever they want, have the pride of, the, of whatever they want. But the moment you speak about Jesus, all of a sudden you've crossed the line. That's not the way this works. It is simply this. You go and be a witness to people. Okay? Uh, and, and not just that, uh, there are so many people in your life that would never walk across the threshold of a church, but they'll listen to your story. And if they listen to your story, maybe they believe and maybe they will walk into a church and be a part of this lo local expression. Or maybe they might have some more questions about it and you're like, I don't know, go talk to Carlisle. Uh, you know, whatever it is, and then they could walk in, but it's an opportunity to invite people in through an individual witness. And sometimes it works just like that. Other times, a third way we see in Acts is uh, they met needs of people. 
They just simply served people. In Acts chapter 3, we see a man who was lame from birth. Not he was a loser. Uh, he just didn't have uh, strong ankles. He couldn't walk. And he asked uh, some of the apostles, hey, is there anything you can give me? Like, give me some money. And he says, look, money I don't have, but what I do have, I now give you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Now, some of you are like, man, that'd be great if I could do that. That'd be really cool. Uh, but I don't think I can make a lame guy walk. That's totally fine. Oftentimes, we just give what we have, and we can meet needs. And there's so many opportunities similar to Second Saturday yesterday where we, where we had a group of people go out and serve 80 people food in downtown Phoenix uh, because they were homeless and were hungry. Oftentimes, when you meet a need, somebody is more open to an opportunity to hear about Jesus. And so this is what we see all throughout the book of Acts is they were just meeting needs, and as they met needs, people came to faith. And then lastly, we see uh, the teaching. Now, teaching is different than preaching. Teaching is more public from a stage. I think teaching is more at a table where people have questions. And they don't, and, and maybe you don't have all the answers, but hey, hey, let's work through this together. And so we see in Acts chapter 17 that the Apostle Paul would actually go into groups and synagogues and he would debate and reason with Jewish people about the Old Testament text and how Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. He just taught them. And oftentimes it's just in, in kids and in students and in small group, it's just an opportunity for you to teach and it's an opportunity for people to come to faith. You see, evangelism isn't that hard. Uh, we just try to put too much pressure on ourselves and don't allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. Uh, it, it's, it's really not that difficult. But, but once again, the amazing thing is, as we see all throughout the book of Acts, is that it just wasn't the apostles. I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough. It wasn't just the church leaders who went forward to reach people. It was individual Jesus followers who took up the mandate as their personal responsibility, and they went and did what Jesus said. You see, uh, this goes into the second part here, evangelism as seen at journey. If we want the same result to the first church, where people are being saved, healed, restored, families coming to faith, marriages strengthened, generosity overflows, culture changed and shaped by Jesus, then we must have the same focus as the first church. We need to be a group of Jesus followers here in North Peoria that takes the mandate of Jesus as our personal responsibility. That is our call. And listen, church, you don't need to know all the answers. You just need to know two things, the message of salvation and your story. You need to know the message of salvation. What is the gospel? We've, we've defined that. So it's before Jesus, I was this. After Jesus, this is what he did in my life. Before Jesus, I, I was sinful, I was a cheater, I was, an, I, I was addicted, I was astray, a I was the prodigal son or daughter. Before Jesus, my life was a mess, my marriage was a mess, my kids were a mess, my sin was absolutely overwhelming, I felt like there was no hope, but after I became a Jesus follower, I am free. After I became a Jesus follower, my, my marriage was strengthened. After I became a Jesus follower, my, my family was strengthened. After I became a Jesus follower, my finances were figured out. You figure out whatever your story is, but you need to just know the message of Jesus and you need to know your story. And when you know those two things, fear no longer exists. Because somebody might ask you a question that you don't know. That's great. I'll get back to you. Uh, you don't have to be fearful of going uh, and having conflict because the Holy Spirit has already gone before you. You see, I, I, wanna, I want you to understand this. The goal to evangelism isn't just to see people at church. The goal is to see them in heaven. Because unfortunately, I believe there's a lot of people that I see at church I may never see in heaven. And we just think that coming to church equals you are a Christian, and that is not the case. So what is our calling card today? I'm going to give you the calling card. I'm going to read you a story, and we're going to get out of here in time for lunch. Okay, Gary? Uh, so it's going to be great. This is our calling card for evangelism, and I want you to do this as a family. Number one, go on prayer walks around your neighborhood. Go on prayer walks around your neighborhood. And as you go by each house, pause for five seconds. You don't need to know their name. And if you do, that's awesome. And if you don't, try to find out. Uh, but just pray over that house and ask that God would give you an opportunity. And then go to the next 
and then go to the next. And, go, and just begin to till the soil of your neighborhood. And if somebody's out in their patio or if they're out in their garage and you're stopping there and you're, and you're praying over them, hands out, you can stand however you want. And they're like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, I, I'm just praying for you and your family. Well, you don't know me. I know, but I, I just want like, to pray. Is there any way I could pray for you and your family? If they give you a prayer request, stop right there and pray for them. And if they're like, get off my lawn, man, it's like, all right, I'm going to pray for your anger, chill out, okay? And you just go to the next house. Just go on a prayer walk. And maybe it might get too hot, go later at night, okay? Like, as you're driving to work, start praying for them also. Like, whatever it is, begin to just in your vicinity, in your neighborhood, that God would begin to till some soil. The next is be aware of the promptings of the Holy Spirit. There's things inside of you and inside of me, inside of my heart, where if I see somebody who's in need, I feel a prompting, and I'm like, man, I know I should help that person, but I'm too busy, I got a boot, whatever it is, okay? And we always make an excuse, and then we leave, and it's not like God's uh, mad at us, but we feel like we've let him down. This is us not following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving you an opportunity, so when you feel it inside of your spirit, you can go and do exactly what it says. Do what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Rather simple. This is our calling card, and, and this is why I say this, is because uh, you never know what hangs in the balance when you tell other people about Jesus. You never know what hangs in the balance you never know if God using you to tell somebody about Jesus means that the next generation of their family is going to be Jesus followers also. You never know what hangs in the balance when you tell somebody about Jesus and they were thinking the next day they were going to take their life and now they're not. You never know what God is willing to do on the other side of you inviting people uh, into a relationship with Jesus or inviting them to journey. And some people might accept then and there, and some others are like, man, one what? we'll see you later. That's fine. But you might just begin to begin to till the soil of someone's soul, to begin to, to hack away at a hard heart that God might be able to use you as a starting point, not the ending point. You see, if we fight about who gets the credit and we think that it's our responsibility to get the credit, you've already lost the game. Jesus always gets the credit. So regardless if someone believes right then or later, uh, it doesn't matter. So you don't have to live in fear of thinking, well, they're just going to th just throw me off or, or, or say I'm a bigot or whatever it is they want to call you. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, so be here for that. Uh, but whatever they want to call, hey, you don't have to fear about that because it's not in your hands. It's in God's. And so with that, I want to read a little bit of a longer story. It's going to take us to the end of our time today about the man on George Street his name is Frank Jenner, not Jenner, okay? Uh, we don't have Kardashians around here, okay? Uh, Frank Jenner. True story that I found a few months back. It says this. This all started a number of years ago in a church in Crystal Palace in South London. The Sunday morning service was closing, and a man stood up in the back and raised his hand and said, Excuse me, Pastor, can I share a short testimony? The pastor looked at his watch and said, well, you have two minutes. And the man proceeded with his story. I've just moved into this area. I used to live in Sydney, Australia. And a few months back, I was visiting some relatives and I was walking down George Street. A single little white haired man stepped out from a shop doorway, put a pamphlet in my hand and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, will you go to heaven? I was astonished by these words. No one had ever asked me that. I thanked him courteously, and all the way home to London, this puzzled me. So I called a friend, and thanked God he was a Christian, and he led me to Christ. Everyone applauded and welcomed him into their fellowship. The pastor flew to Adeline, Australia the next day, and 10 days later, in the middle of a three-day series in the church of Adeline, a woman came up to him for some counseling. He wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. She said, I used to live in Sydney, and just a couple of months back, I was visiting some friends and doing some last-minute shopping down George Street. A strange little white-haired man stepped out of his shop doorway and offered me a pamphlet and said, Excuse me, madam, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? I was disturbed by these words. When I got home, I knew this church was on the next block from me. I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ, so I'm telling you, I am a Christian. 
The London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice in two weeks, he had heard the same testimony. Then he flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Church in Perth, where his teaching series was over. over uh, when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for a meal, and the pastor asked the elder how he got saved. He said, I grew up at this church from the age of 15. I never made a commitment to Jesus but hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. Because of my business ability, I grew to a place of influence. I was on a business trip in, in Sydney just three years ago. An obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet, and accosted me with this question. Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? I tried to tell him I was an elder in my church and he wouldn't listen. I was seething with anger all the way home from Sydney to Perth. And I told my pastor thinking he would sympathize, but he agreed with the old man. He had been disturbed for years knowing I didn't have a relationship with Jesus and he was right. My pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. The London preacher flew home and was soon speaking at Keswick conventions in the Lake District. And he threw in these three testimonies. At the close of this teaching series, four elderly pastors came up and explained that they too had been saved between 25 and 30 years earlier through the same little man on George Street offering a pamphlet and asking the same question. The following week, he flew to a similar Keshwick convention in the Caribbean to missionaries. He shared the same testimony. At the close of his teaching, three missionaries came forward and said they had been saved between 15 and 25 years earlier by the same little man's testimony at the same question on George Street in Sydney. Next, he stopped in Atlanta, Georgia to speak at the Naval Chaplain Convention. Here for three days, he spoke to over a thousand Naval chaplains. And afterward, the Chaplain General took him out for a meal and he asked the chaplain how he became a Christian. It was miraculous, the chaplain said. I was raiding on the Naval battleship and I lived a reputable life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific and, he, and we docked in Sydney Harbor for replenishments. We at King's Cross with a vengeance. I was blind drunk, got on the wrong bus and got off on George Street. As I got off the bus, I thought I saw a ghost as this man jumped out in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my hand and you can guess what he asked. Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? The fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober, ran back to the ship, and sought out the chaplain. He led me to Christ, and I soon began the ministry under his guidance. I am now in charge of a thousand chaplain who are bent on soul winning today. Six months later, the London pastor flew to a conference for 5,000 Indian missionaries in the remote part of Northeast India. At the end of the head missionary took him to his humble little home for a simple meal, and he asked how this Hindu became a Christian. And the man said, I grew up in a very privileged position. I worked in the Indian d diplomatic mission and I traveled the world. I'm so glad for the, for the forgiveness of Christ and the blood covering my sin. I would have been very embarrassed if people found out what I got into. One period of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. I was doing some last minute shopping, laden with toys and clothes for my children. I was walking down George Street when a courteous, white haired little man stepped out in front of me and offered me a pamphlet. And he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to town, sought after our Hindu priest and well, he couldn't help me. But he advised me to satisfy my curious mind. I should go talk to the missionary in the mission home at the end of the road. That was good advice because that day the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism, immediately began to prepare for ministry. I left the diplomatic service and here I am today by God's grace in charge of all these missionaries who have together led 100,000 people to Christ. Eight months later, that London pastor was preaching in Sydney, and he asked a local minister if he knew of a little elderly, haired, a white-haired man who handed out tracts on George Street. And he said, yes, I do. His name is Mr. Jannar. Although I don't think he does it anymore because he is so frail and elderly. Two nights later, we went to meet him in his little apartment. They knocked on the door, and a tiny, frail old man greeted him. He sat down and made them tea. The London preacher sat there and told him of all these accounts though, over the past previous years. This little man sat there with tears running down his cheeks and he told them this story. He said, I was enlisted in the Australian warship. I was living a shameless life. In a crisis, I really hit the wall and one of my colleagues who I gave literal hell to was there to help me. 
He led me to Jesus and the change in my life was night and day and 24 hours. I was so grateful to God, I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day. As God gave me strength, I did just that. I wasn't paranoid about it. I have done this for 40 years. In my retirement years, the best place was on St. George Street where I saw hundreds of people a day. I got a lot of rejections, but a lot of people courteously took my track. In 40 years of doing this, I never heard of a single person coming to Jesus until today. You know, and this is how the pastor ends it, you know, I would say that he has to be committed to show gratitude and love for Jesus to do that for 40 years and not hear any results. This simple little non-charismatic white, wit, or white man witnessed to perhaps, white haired man, I should say, geez, uh, witnessed to perhaps 147,000 people. I think God was showing that pastor from London was the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Mr. Jannar died two weeks after that encounter. Uh, can you imagine the reward when he went home to be in heaven? No one except a little group of Christians in Sydney knew about Mr. Jannar, but I tell you, his name is famous in heaven. Heaven knew him. And you can imagine the welcome and the red carpet and the fanfare he received when he went home to glory. You see, you never know what hangs in the balance as you take responsibility for the mandate Jesus gives you to evangelize to others. Mr. Jannar had a track and a pamphlet. You are that story. You go and tell the story of Jesus. It is how the church grew and it's how heaven is populated. May it be here, true, in Journey and in North Peoria also. Go out and be the witness God is calling you to be. Father, we love you. We thank you. Lord, we praise you that you allow us to partner with you in this mission, that we don't deserve it nor earn it. And for whatever reason, you've chosen this bunch of people here in North Peoria to make a difference here for your kingdom. So Jesus, may we bring heaven to earth and may you bring earth to heaven. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Hey, just a couple things as you go. If you need prayer, we want to add our faith to your faith in the prayer corner and come uh, together and pray for you in any way necessary, uh, as well as uh, $3 lunch today. Hang out with your family, play some games. Uh, we just want to build relationships with you. We love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do declare it.